America and other free and open societies face crucial challenges and opportunities abroad that affect security and prosperity at home. This is a series of conversations with guests who bring deep understanding of today's battlegrounds and creative ideas about how to compete, overcome challenges, capitalize on opportunities, and secure a better future. I am H.R. McMaster. This is Battlegrounds. In today's inaugural episode of Battlegrounds, our focus is on Afghanistan, a country facing daunting challenges that have important implications for American and international security. Our guest today is Afghanistan's Foreign Minister, Mohammad Hanif Atmar. Minister Atmar is a humanitarian as well as a fighter. He provided aid to Afghans beset by a civil war that raged when the Taliban took over the country in 1996. He was seriously wounded during the brutal nine-year war between the Mujahideen and the Afghan government. Our guest is a dedicated public servant, taking on important tasks in government as Minister of Rural Rehabilitation and Development in the transitional government in 2002, and later as Minister of Education. He has also served as the Minister of the Interior and National Security Advisor. Now, he is Afghanistan's senior most diplomat, fighting to secure peace for Afghans after over four decades of war. His is a landlocked multi-ethnic nation that has been at the crossroads of civilizations and religions since ancient times. Afghans have a reputation for warm hospitality, as well as a fierce determination to preserve autonomy. Their mountainous country, slightly larger than the state of Texas, borders Iran, Pakistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and China. Although most Afghans farm its lush valleys and fertile plains, about 25% of the population reside in burgeoning cities. Minister Otmar and Afghans of his generation have known mainly war. The 1980s was marked by resistance to brutal Soviet occupation. A civil war followed, and the Taliban seized power in 1996. The Taliban brutalized the Afghan people for five years until the American-led coalition drove them out of Kabul in November 2001, just two months after al-Qaeda, the terrorist organization that the Taliban harbored, conducted the most devastating terrorist mass murder in history. Afghanistan had not seen a democratic, peaceful transition. Until President Hamid Karzai transferred power to President Ashraf Ghani in September 2014, at this moment Afghan forces are taking the brunt of the fight to secure the country and preserve enormous strides made in education, women's rights, democratic governance, free speech and rule of law. About 64% of Afghanistan's 39 million citizens are under 25 years of age. With security, education, jobs, and basic health care, young Afghans could produce tremendous prosperity. But there is still much work to be done. The Taliban, despite suffering tremendous losses, continues to regenerate in Pakistan, alongside other terrorist organizations. As many Americans express weariness over its longest war, the hard-won gains, for which over 2,400 Americans and almost 1,200 coalition servicemen and women made the ultimate sacrifice, are at risk. According to a United Nations report, more than 100,000 Afghan civilians have been killed or hurt in the last 10 years of the war. Afghan soldiers are fighting harder than ever to protect their fellow citizens. While 10 U.S. servicemen have lost their lives in Afghanistan this year, Afghan forces are averaging 30 fatalities a day. Minister Atmar, thank you for joining us for this inaugural episode of Battlegrounds. It is great to see you. I hope all is well with you and your family during this challenging time for all of us. Thank you, General. Salam alaikum to you and to everybody else uh, there. Um, it's such a pleasure to see you after 
almost two years. And it's an honor to be on, on your program. And I uh, very much appreciate this opportunity that we have uh, uh, the kind of exchange that is important for our people and for our policymakers about the future uh, and the shared interest of both countries. Well, salam alaikum, Minister. Great, great, really great to see you. I thought I might begin with just a general question for you. In, in, in 2010 to 2012, I don't know if you remember this, but I spent a lot of time in your living room. Uh, we, we had just met and I had just arrived in Afghanistan in 2010 for a, about a two-year tour of duty. And, and, uh, and you had just left one of your many leadership positions in the Afghan government as Minister of Interior. And you were sort of my professor uh, in a crash course in Afghan history and politics and society. And, and you've lived uh, Afghanistan's turbulent recent history. And I, I wonder if you might just share with our viewers what you think they should know about Afghanistan's past and how that past informs the present. Well, thank you so much, uh, General. It was always a pleasure to talk to you as a great friend, a friend with very high respect um, that uh, um, uh, we had for you and for your colleagues and uh, for the U.S. Uh, uh, great service uh, men and women and uh, the civilians who were out there to assist us um, and uh, we, we always have uh, a great deal of appreciation and respect uh, uh, and, and we pay tribute uh, to the memories of all those who made the ultimate sacrifice, the uh, U.S. great soldiers, our international partners and the Afghan National Security Forces. Uh, so uh, trying to help you to help Afghanistan was always a pleasure. Uh, and with your distinguished career and uh, your dedicated service, uh, it was an honor uh, to serve together uh, with you in whatever capacity uh, I was uh, assigned uh, to, to serve the nation. Um, so it, it was always nice also to learn from your experience uh, 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 internationally. Uh, in terms of our history, I mean, like any other nation, we are uh, proud of our history. We uh, have a, a, a long and shared history as a multi-ethnic nation uh, and uh, with a great civilization. We, we have contributed to the uh, uh, Asian European civilization, and we also in turn benefited from that civilization uh, in a big way. Um, uh, now, the, the past 40 years in Afghanistan uh, have been particularly uh, difficult and uh, uh, historically extremely challenging to our nation, uh, 40 years of conflict. Uh, it uh, started with the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and uh, became very quickly um, a battlefield uh, of the Cold War, uh, especially be be between uh, the West and, and the Soviet Union. Uh, that uh, decade ended with the defeat of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, uh, followed by a decade, uh, a little more than a decade, of uh, a proxy regional war uh, with strong involvement of international terrorism, uh, but also with uh, uh, um, um, uh, civil war characteristics uh, that, that often uh, mislead the, the analysts uh, uh, it was never a civil war, it was always a proxy 
a regional war with enforcement of, of international terrorism. That, that brought Taliban to power with six years of brutality and their war on human rights and women's rights. Um, and, and they allowed international terrorism to grow in Afghanistan, which was never something that the Afghan nation accepted. Um, this led to 9-11 and uh, those dramatic uh, 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 incidents. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the attacks were planned uh, and uh, managed from uh, uh, the region uh, uh, with the presence of Al-Qaeda uh, that was harbored by, by the Taliban. So with the U.S. intervention and uh, the toppling of Taliban, a, a new era uh, emerged. Uh, and, and, and over the past uh, two decades, Afghans have been, uh, with assistance from the United States and the international community, on one hand, uh, fighting terrorism uh, on behalf of the international community, and on the other, uh, rebuilding a country, uh, its state institutions, its public services, uh, uh, to serve the Afghan men and women uh, alike. Uh, and, and we are still in that struggle. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we are proud that we are part of an international coalition uh, for the security of uh, the humanity. It's not just about the United States and Afghanistan and NATO members. It's about uh, the, the humanity, the global community by extension. Um, but, but of course, we, we bear the cost, uh, and it's a significant endeavor, national endeavor. Well, th thank you, Minister. You know, I want to thank you for the, your service and sacrifice, and, and the service and sacrifice of so many Afghan servicemen and women, and the Afghan people. And the, it's very clear now that the, it's the Afghan military and police who are really bearing the brunt of this fight against the Taliban. Al Qaeda, ISIS, and, and other terrorist organizations. And I remember when you were National Security Advisor in Afghanistan, and I was National Security Advisor in the United States, we often talked about, and this is two years ago right now, how Americans were, were losing patience with what had become their longest war. And you're already alluding to this, but it seems sometimes that we Americans have, have short memories, and, and we almost have to remind ourselves of that memory of September 11th, 2001, and, and, and those attacks. Uh, to, to remind ourselves of the importance of the region and the region never again hosting a terrorist organization like Al Qaeda capable of inflicting such devastating loss. And, and it was, of course, it was the Taliban that hosted Al Qaeda. And then after the US led coalition deposed uh, the Taliban government, it was Al Qaeda, uh, along with the Pakistani Army's intelligence directorate, that helped the Taliban regenerate. And so could you maybe emphasize even a little bit more what you see as the stakes in Afghanistan, really for Americans and, and all civilized peoples, but, but not really only in Afghanistan, but across your 1,500 mile long border uh, with Pakistan. Of course, Pakistan, a, a nuclear armed populist country that the U.S. government has described as a place where terrorists are able to organize, plan, raise funds, recruit train and operate in, in relative uh, sec security uh, because of either inadequate capacity, uh, but I think more political will, or probably a combination of both. So what is at stake for Americans? What would you say to the American people about this longest war and why it's important to sustain our efforts there? Uh, first of all, um, uh, in whatever way there is a uh, response from our American friends, but one thing is absolutely clear to us and uh, to both our government and people, and that is that we are a grateful nation and we will always pay tribute to the memories of all those who sacrificed their lives in Afghanistan uh, and we will remain grateful to also your taxpayers and your generosity uh, to, to, to support our uh, common mission. 
uh, in this respect, regardless of, of policy success or failures in some respect, uh, but what has uh, always been uh, so admirably remembered by Afghanistan is um, the uh, solidarity and, and the partnership of the Ab American people uh, with, uh, with us um, and, and the region. Uh, on the issue of what is at stake for, for the United States, Afghanistan, and the international community, uh, it's honestly security. It's the security of our people and the security of our state institutions. Uh, it's the national security interests of all of us. Uh, and uh, to try to serve those interests, to protect them, is a shared responsibility, and we should never get tired of fulfilling that responsibility because security is a constant uh, and a noble uh, and a shared responsibility of all of us. Uh, so uh, getting tired of it or becoming weary about it uh, will, will not allow us to, to fulfill that responsibility towards our people. Now, is this real? Uh, really, is it a, uh, uh, our security? Uh, yes, uh, our assessment is that, uh, to begin with, uh, the, the United States security and, and that of the international community was threatened uh, uh, by the terrorists uh, who uh, had uh, found a safe haven uh, in the region between Afghanistan and, and, and Pakistan. Uh, the 9-11 uh, attacks were planned from there, uh, and many other attacks were also planned uh, fr from there. And absolutely, there is no reason not to believe that if we allow the space and the ground to, uh, to the terrorists there, that such incidents would not happen again. It will happen because these terrorists are the enemies of our civilization. Uh, it's the enemy of the humanity. So they won't spare us. Uh, uh, those who believe that uh, uh, by ignoring terrorism or disengaging from fighting the terrorism, we will be safe. Uh, unfortunately, they need to think again. Uh, this, the history does not show uh, uh, um, uh, that uh, or support that fact. Uh, I mean, remember after the fall of uh, or the defeat of uh, the, the Soviets and the fall of the communist uh, regime in Afghanistan, um, the United States and our Western partners felt that, okay, it, it, it's uh, no more necessary to remain engaged and there is no threat from Afghanistan, but there was a, a threat. Uh, that mistake, that error should not be repeated again. Uh, and especially not now after so much sacrifices and so much investment in blood and, and, and treasure. So uh, specifically, what, 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 what might happen? Uh, generally, you have a better sense of this than, than anybody else. Uh, um, uh, um, with your uh, last uh, senior position as the National Security Advisor of the United States. Um, uh, it's not just the Taliban that we are fighting in Afghanistan at the moment. There are four groups of uh, uh, transnational terror networks. Uh, there are those that are Afghans, and then uh, the, the, the second group is um, the regional terrorists, such as IMU, ETIM, uh, 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 and um, uh, uh, Pakistani terrorists as the third uh, category, such as the lashkar e taiba the TTP, the jaish e muhammad and then international terrorists, such as Al-Qaeda and Daesh, ISIL, uh, in there. They all have symbiotic relationships not only among themselves, but also with transnational organized criminal networks. Uh, they benefit from narcotics, they benefit from um, uh, organized crime. Uh, now, uh, uh, and they collectively pose 
a national security threat collectively to the region and the world community. Uh, uh, I was looking at the list of the, the 20 plus terrorist organizations in the region. There's hardly any country that doesn't have an enemy or two among them. Uh, and sometimes some of us, like the United States and Afghanistan, all of those 20 organizations will be uh, uh, keen to hurt us. So it is our shared responsibility. We should not get tired. And now that the Afghan people are actually uh, uh, shouldering the, 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 the significant part of that burden, uh, and, and with uh, continued as, uh, assistance from the international community, we have every reason to believe that we will succeed. Uh, and and a, it's been a great investment. So uh, to, to, to sum it up, I strongly believe that we have a noble reason to continue to stay engaged and to continue to protect our people. Uh, and, and our shared humanity. And I also have strong reasons that we are succeeding. This is working. Uh, it has worked over the past 20 years. Um, uh, uh, disengagement would not work. Disengagement would unfortunately uh, benefit uh, the enemy. You, you Mr. Amor, you make, I think, a real important point that's worth reemphasizing is that this is a terrorist ecosystem here uh, along the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And these organizations, they share people and resources and training. A, a very good analyst uh, on, on this problem set in the United States, Tom Jocelyn, he has this phrase that we try too hard to disconnect the dots. But I think oftentimes what, why Americans are, are, are losing patience is they, they, they say, well, this is an 18 year war. But the point that sometimes I try to make to them is it's actually been more like a one-year war, 18 times over, in connection with the inconsistency in the effort, I think initially, after the very successful military campaign in 2001, we, we took our eyes away from Afghanistan, focusing principally on Iraq for a number of years. And then I think the Bush administration, to its credit, realized the neglect that it needed to do more to consolidate military gains and get to a sustainable political outcome. And this is when you saw a greatly reinforced effort. But then the Obama administration, of course, announces troop withdrawals at the same time as, as, as additional reinforcements are arriving. I mean, I could go on about this. I'll stop. But I wonder if you just might say a word about the inconsistency of the effort over time, because Americans want to know what's at stake. But they also want to know, is there a strategy available that can be implemented at an acceptable cost uh, over time to accomplish the objectives. And, and you mentioned how Afghanistan is bearing the brunt of the fight, right? The, the cost uh, is orders of magnitude less than it was at the, at the peak of the U.S. force commitment in Afghanistan. What do you see as, as what had been our fundamental flaws in, in, this, in this long war? And then what is your vision going forward uh, to, to, to ensure that Afghanistan can secure a future of, of security uh, and, and protect the Afghan people and humanity from these grave threats? Humbly put, from my side, I would uh, uh, point to five things that, that, that went wrong. Uh, 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 but none of them uh, the responsibility of our uh, brave men and women in uniform. These failures were related to politics rather than the sacrifices, the valor, and uh, the, the hard work of uh, uh, our brave men and women in uniform. Um, the number one issue was uh, not to think about reconciliation early on and to give an option to the Taliban uh, who uh, were uh, devastated uh, uh, and wanted to have an honorable option. Uh, but at that point, collectively, we failed to give them an option of uh, an honorable reconciliation. And, and sometimes we drove them away from Afghanistan. That was a bad policy. Uh, it wasn't a good choice. 
Um, the second uh, uh, failure, again, uh, attributed to, uh, to uh, our uh, policies was not to address uh, the problem of sanctuaries outside Afghanistan. So while the Taliban were driven away from Afghanistan, they were also given sanctuary outside Afghanistan, and we were never able to this day uh, to address that uh, uh, sanctuary problem outside Afghanistan. Uh, the uh, third uh, um, failure was uh, more or less on, on uh, Afghan side, uh, uh, that we failed uh, to build uh, the kind of state and uh, governance uh, that Afghan people deserved. Um, corruption and state failure on, on many fronts uh, were also significant uh, uh, um, uh, failures that sustain uh, or, or the reduced effectiveness of the, 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 the combined effort of Afghan, Afghans and the international community. Uh, I might also say that the Afghan National Security Forces should have been actually grown to the full extent of their capability and strength, uh, 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 especially required for the kind of counterterrorism uh, that we were uh, faced with. Uh, yes, and, uh, a great amount of investment was made in, in and the rebuilding of the Afghan National Security Forces, for which we are eternally uh, grateful. Uh, but but, but uh, we could have done uh, more, especially to develop the Afghan army's capabilities in terms of close air support. Uh, uh, our special forces are the best in, in the region. Uh, but those special forces critically depend on air mobility and uh, uh, close air support, uh, and I'm thinking of uh, a time when such support is not uh, available or available in a limited way by our US and, and NATO friends. Uh, so um, uh, the, the self-reliance of the Afghan forces is a key issue in, in, in this respect. The, the final uh, flaws uh, uh, or flaw in, in, in our strategy was unfortunately losing regional consensus in support of uh, the counterterrorism and, and the, the stabilization effort. Uh, I mean, in early uh, 2002 and, and uh, up to 2006, we had uh, a great deal of re regional uh, consensus, regional and international consensus and support, but slowly that consensus was weakened, and not necessarily because of issues in Afghanistan, but globally, internationally, there were things that affected uh, relations between the United States and NATO and key actors in the regions in the region such as Russia, China, Iran, Pakistan, uh, and uh, India and Turkey, uh, all of them. So uh, um, your next question is, is an extremely important. Given our learning from, from that uh, history, uh, what is the best way forward? Uh, I mean, uh, the best way forward is, uh, number one, uh, peace between the Afghan people uh, and the Taliban, the Afghan government and the Taliban, but uh, preserving what we have built over the past 19 years uh, and further developing it. Uh, essentially, it's about preservation of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan that is defined by our commitment to human rights, women's rights, uh, good governance, uh, 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 political inclusion of our people, uh, rule of law, uh, and, and all those critical values that modern humanity requires uh, for its uh, functioning. Um, so all of those things would have to be preserved 
we should not lose them uh, as a result of the peace process because no peace will be lasting if it is not built on that foundation. Uh, so uh, this is the goal that we need to achieve, but how to achieve it? Uh, the number one principle to achieve that goal is the partnership between the United States and Afghanistan, uh, and especially our consensus on the end state to achieve uh, uh, through this peace process. And of course, then it's our multi-alignment and partnership with our uh, NATO uh, partners, uh, member partners, uh, also with uh, regional actors. Let me put it simply. On one hand, we have our partners uh, in NATO. On the other hand, we have partners in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, I know it's difficult politically uh, uh, to, to see how that might work, but both partners have strong interests in defeating terrorism and stabilizing Afghanistan and the region. Uh, they have many differences, I know that for sure, uh, but they have at least some common interests uh, with regard to, to those issues. Well, Minister, thank you. I, I want to ask you directly about the peace process, but before we do, I'd like to ask you about your current portfolio as foreign minister, your broad portfolio. You might recall when we were last together, it was at my house in Washington, and we were discussing the need for countries in the region, your neighbors, to play a more constructive role, or in the case of Iran and Pakistan, at least a less destructive role uh, in, in, in helping Afghanistan uh, achieve security and, and, uh, and, and prosperity in, in, in the future. But it doesn't seem to be going very well for you. I mean, it, I, when I look at the Pakistani army continuing to support uh, the Taliban and and, uh, and and the Pakistani prime minister describing Osama bin Laden as a, as a martyr. We have Iran, of course, with reportedly increasing support uh, for the Taliban. And of course, the very troubling reports in the United States uh, have exposed how Russia offered bounties to Taliban linked terrorists to kill American soldiers. So what will it take to get Afghanistan's neighbors to recognize that it's in their interest to defeat these terrorist organizations that are indeed a threat to all humanity. What, what are you working on to help them come to that realization? And what do you think the prospects are for improved dynamics in the region that help you achieve your goals there for the Afghan people? Well, um, thank you again, General. Uh, that wonderful day at your place about two years ago, uh, I still remember that. Uh, there were three things I uh, took away from that day at your place. Uh, first, that lovely lunch and, and uh, your gracious hospitality. Um, second thing, uh, uh, that you knew that day that that was uh, the day uh, that you were uh, uh, leaving the job. But up to the last minute, uh, you remained engaged and you supported the peace and security mission in Afghanistan. And I'm so grateful for that, General. And, and, and the final thing that day was uh, uh, the evening that we went together uh, to a, a reception. There was no official announcement. Uh, and, and you received a hero's welcome there. And uh, the dignified way that you uh, uh, um, handled things uh, on, on that day. On, on, on the issue of uh, uh, how to bring our neighbors together and regional partners to support uh, um, um, the uh, uh, peace and uh, uh, stabilization efforts, uh, the, the, the number one issue uh, uh, is that we built consensus uh, on our common interests. Uh, every, uh, I, I know we have quite a lot of uh, differences in the region, uh, divergence in, in uh, interests elsewhere. But uh, on Afghanistan, there's a great deal of commonality of interests. So national and security interests will have to be the basis, the foundation for our neighbors, the region, 
the United States and our NATO uh, or European friends. Uh, so that is to begin with. It's not so much about ethics, which should be, in fact, because of our shared humanity, uh, the, the, the first factor uh, in our uh, response. Uh, but it, it is about interest. It's their interest. Uh, the second issue is their inclusion uh, in the process. Uh, and, uh, if they are not... Uh, 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 um, included in the process and they don't see their interests and they don't see uh, what they're working towards. Uh, uh, one day a friend call, uh, asked me a question uh, 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 that why do you place so much emphasis on, on, on the end state and regional uh, cooperation and, and consensus? And I said, if, if you uh, 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 don't involve them, they will feel threatened. They, they will not see their common interests and they will undermine your effort. Second, uh, it's important that they see their interests served by the end state of the peace process. If they don't know where the peace process is leading to, they would not support that process. They would not participate in that process. So it's key that uh, the regional partners uh, see their interests in the end state of the peace process and are uh, involved in the process. And number three is that this cannot happen without a solid, effective cooperation between the United States and Afghanistan. Um, we have to work together. We have to uh, uh, ensure the level of cooperation in our diplomatic political work uh, that was uh, uh, demonstrated by our brave men and women in uniform uh, on the battleground. Uh, they deserve that level of cooperation and effectiveness so that we do not let their sacrifices go uh, in vain. Now, uh, I'm not critical of what we are doing together now, but I am encouraging all of us to do more. The current level of our uh, effort uh, is important, uh, but we need to build on it and we need to do more, and we need to make sure uh, that the, the regional partners are, are part of this. We also need to demonstrate to our regional partners that failure uh, to achieve peace and preserve the Islamic Republic in Afghanistan is not in their interest uh, because those four categories of terrorists with their symbiotic relationship with uh, organized transnational organized criminal networks will be a threat not only to their security but also their economic and social prosperity. Well, I, I hope you're successful, and I hope we continue to work together with you to to kind of reduce the the malign efforts of of, of those in the, in the region. Uh, and uh, and I think it's such an important dimension. I'd like to. I know. I think a lot of our viewers are going to be interested, Minister, uh, on your thoughts on the peace agreement that was negotiated between the United States and the, and the Taliban. And and when you were National Security Advisor, we worked together to challenge what we saw as as flawed assumptions about the conflict, such as wishful thinking that there's this bold line you know, between the Taliban and Al Qaeda and other terrorist organizations. And I'm a little bit concerned that there are these misunderstandings may have underpinned this agreement as well. But how do you feel about the peace agreement, the, the assumptions on which it rests? And, and what is your plan going, going forward at, at a time where, where there hasn't been you know, the promised reduction in violence, right? It, 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 the opposite is, is happening. Now in, in, in Afghanistan, as, as uh, the Taliban has actually intensified the violence against Afghan security forces and, and especially against the Afghan uh, people. I mean, it, it's heartbreaking to see these attacks on hospitals and health facilities in the midst of the pandemic. And, and I think everyone's heart broke when they saw this attack on a, on a maternity ward in Kabul, uh, during which terrorists systematically murdered uh, mothers and, and infants, which was which was horrible, you know, and and, and uh, even based on what we know as the enemy's inhumanity. So, are, are the talks 
feasible uh, under these conditions? And, and what, is, what is your plan going forward? Do you see a viable end state to the Afghan, intra-Afghan peace negotiations? Um, thank you so much, General. Uh, the, the first question uh, uh, that relates to the assumptions underpinning the, the peace agreement between the United States and, and the Taliban. Um, the key objective of that agreement is uh, to achieve an end state, uh, which is um, uh, Afghanistan not to become a safe haven for international terrorists uh, uh, that, that, that might threaten the United States, the region, and, and the rest. Uh, and the key assumption is that if there is peace between the Taliban and the United States, and between the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan, we could achieve that uh, outcome. Uh, 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 that is true. Uh, to this, uh, up to this point, it, it's fine. Uh, but what I would add to it to uh, make sure that we have uh, a full understanding of, of the dynamics uh, and make the, uh, uh, the right assumptions in, in, in terms of achieving the end state. Uh, the number one is that the end state should be acceptable to the Afghan people. Now, peace without human rights, democracy, and what we've built together will not be acceptable to the Afghan people, uh, regardless of how many agreements uh, can be signed between uh, 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 world powers and the Taliban and the Afghan uh, government and Taliban. That end state will have to be acceptable to the Afghan uh, people. And as I said, uh, uh, the end state is not just, uh, General, this is so important. It's not about ideology. Uh, it is true, we, we believe, strongly believe in human rights, women's rights, democracy, uh, uh, rule of law, uh, uh, political inclusion. Uh, that, that is true. But it's also a reality. Without this, there will be no peace in Afghanistan. So, uh, uh, well, the, any agreement we sign, any agreement we want to implement will have to work towards that kind of end state. Um, second point I would have to make that that end state will also have to be acceptable to the regional actors. Now, one good news is that the end state I just described uh, a sovereign, independent, uh, unified Afghanistan ruled by constitutional democracy, committed to human rights, women's rights, and uh, also strongly committed to multi-alignment and multilateralism in the region and beyond the region, is a kind of end state that the region will also uh, support, will we'll subscribe to. So this is the good news, that for the first time in history of Afghanistan, uh, the in-state that we are proposing for the peace process is acceptable to the Afghan people, to our regional partners, and our international partners. So uh, this will have to be uh, the, the guiding principle uh, for uh, uh, the United States uh, diplomacy as well as that of Afghanistan and the region and, uh, and our international partners. Second point uh, is, is uh, uh, peace uh, uh, um, um, negotiation and talks uh, feasible at this point. If the violence, the kind of violence that you, you, you just referred to is continued, no. Uh, because uh, uh, um, I mean killing innocent people uh, 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 under any pretext uh, will not be acceptable to the uh, world community. Uh, um, and, and the Afghan, uh, Afghans uh, are asking a question uh, that so far the Taliban sole argument for continuation of violence was the presence of foreign troops. Okay, if there's any truth in that, they have signed an agreement with the United States which stipulates 
that if certain things happen, the foreign troops will withdraw from Afghanistan. Uh, well, we're all for it because uh, generally you know that in 2014, I signed the BSA on behalf of the, the, the bilateral security agreement between Afghanistan and the United States, and so far the, the security agreement between Afghanistan and NATO. We sign that on behalf of the Afghan government and people, uh, and in that agreement, we stipulated on conditions for uh, a withdrawal of, of foreign troops from Afghanistan. Uh, so we, we all want uh, conditions-based uh, withdrawal of troops, but long-term uh, cooperation, security cooperation, uh, uh, political and economic cooperation, uh, cooperations between Afghanistan and uh, the United States, uh, our Western partners and, and regional partners. So um, in, in this respect, uh, I, I come back to, to the main point uh, that, uh, yes, the talks will be supported by the Afghan people, uh, and, and the reduction in violence is key uh, to uh, uh, achieving uh, that goal, uh, and the Taliban must uh, remain faithful to the commitment they have made, uh, they said they will stop violence one, once they reach an agreement with uh, on, on foreign troops withdrawal. So fine, they have that agreement. Why? And, and at the moment, to be honest with you, they are not fighting the United States uh, troops in Afghanistan. <laughs> they are fighting uh, Afghan troops and Afghan people. There's absolutely no justification for that. Uh, uh, and, and we have to make sure that that violence level comes down. Uh, so that the uh, uh, negotiation between the Afghan government and the Taliban uh, starts. Well, thanks, Minister. I wonder if, if you are at liberty to share any of your thoughts about how the talks might proceed. If they get going, uh, who's going to participate? Uh, what can you share about your approach to the negotiations? What will, what will Afghan officials say to the Taliban leaders? And, and do you have in mind a sequence of events to get to the get to that end state, that desired end state that you that you described. Uh, first, on the participation on behalf of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, uh, when uh, I refer to the full name of our state because this uh, includes all of us, uh, the government, the opposition, everybody who. Uh, lives in uh, Afghanistan under the Afghan constitution. They are represented by the Islamic Republic. And on the other side, it is the, the, the Taliban. So uh, from our side, it will be a team uh, led, uh, a team with a strength of 21 people led by uh, Minister Stanikzai, our competent uh, minister. Uh, and uh, uh, he, the team is led also by some of our best uh, uh, national leaders, uh, women that we are proud of, uh, uh, and, and they're leading the team, various uh, committees of, of, or subcommittees of the team. Uh, and the team collectively represents uh, the multiplicity of the Afghan society and and polity. Uh, it's very good, very good team, and it it's, uh, uh, enjoys full national support. From the Taliban side, obviously, it will be their team. Uh, now, in terms of what we hope to discuss with the Taliban, the number one issue will be a humanitarian ceasefire. Uh, uh, it's key now because our people are being uh, killed by both the violence and the COVID-19 pandemic. If we reach uh, a, 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 an agreement on ceasefire, uh, the government of Afghanistan and our international partners will be able to deliver the critical uh, life-saving and life-sustaining services to the population uh, during this pandemic. Uh, so it's their responsibility uh, uh, to, to negotiate a ceasefire with us. Uh, number two is then about the end state of what we want to achieve uh, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, 
uh, uh, together with, with uh, the Taliban. Uh, number three, it's not necessarily in that order, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, reintegration, the return of refugees, the reintegration of uh, uh, hopefully ex-combatants, uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, constitution, uh, the uh, uh, implementation of the, the peace agreement, the, uh, and, and then more importantly, the uh, conditions-based uh, withdrawal of uh, foreign troops, but also making sure that all foreign fighters uh, are thrown out of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, I mean, the uh, one key condition for the withdrawal of foreign troops is uh, the elimination of uh, foreign fighters in Afghanistan, because we are not uh, supposed to be making peace with them. We are making peace only with one category of the four categories that we are fighting, i.e. the Afghan insurgents, but the regional, the Pakistani, and the international uh, networks will have to leave Afghanistan, and, and this will have to be reflected in, in the negotiation, and we need to secure commitment. Uh, for that. Uh, so rather than going into details of all those issues, but it's key for the Taliban and the Afghan government to agree on a ceasefire, uh, a humanitarian and then a permanent ceasefire. Second, to agree on an end state uh, of, of our uh, political system. Uh, third, to agree on the departure of foreign troops, but a long-term co security cooperation, security and, and, and political and economic cooperation with our uh, international partners. Uh, in terms of sequencing that we are looking at, uh, at things at the moment is, uh, number one, uh, to see some flexibility from the Taliban side on the prisoners' release. Uh, 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 they were promised up to 5,000 prisoners to be released. Already uh, 4,400 uh, 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 are released. Uh, but, but the government is ready to release another 600. So the second step is reduction in, in violence, a reduction in violence and on prisoners' release. Uh, third is start of the negotiation between uh, the Afghan government and the Taliban. Uh, and then reaching uh, agreement on humanitarian ceasefire uh, and permanent uh, ceasefire, um, uh, 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 reaching, of course, peace agreement. Uh, that peace agreement will have to be then uh, supported, endorsed, and guaranteed uh, by the international community, uh, whatever forum, but we will have to involve the UN Security Council uh, and uh, uh, our international partners. So that is the kind of se sequencing that, that we are looking at. Well, Minister, you've been so generous with your time. Thank you for sharing that vision. I'd like to ask you one last question, though. I mean, you might not know the statistic. I mean, it was shocking to me that, but over 800,000 Americans have served in Afghanistan uh, in and out of uniform over the past 18 years. And of course, you already mentioned the over 2,400 American servicemen and women and the 1,200 coalition servicemen and women uh, and, and aid workers from over 30 nations who have given their lives there. I think what Americans don't hear about, because we do you know, understandably focus on the problems that we're encountering in Afghanistan, Americans don't understand, I don't think, what the service and sacrifice of their fellow Americans has accomplished there alongside courageous and dedicated Afghans like yourself. So could you share with our viewers how has Afghanistan today, and, and you served really leading an aid effort in Afghanistan during the very dark years, you know, of the 1990s, during the Civil War, during the Taliban period, you've seen it all. Can you share with our, our, our viewers really uh, how Afghanistan has changed, what is, how it's been transformed since 2001 to today? What are some of the accomplishments you're proud of and, and are most anxious, as you mentioned, uh, to, to preserve. Uh, absolutely. Well, first of all, let me again pay my tribute uh, to the sacrifices of, of those brave men and women in uniform and civilians and to the taxpayers of the United States and to the leaders 
of the United States for remaining committed uh, to, to this mission. Uh, I mean, uh, frankly speaking, we need to look at two big things that we've achieved or together uh, with uh, 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 those uh, uh, sacrifices and uh, selfless uh, service of, of, of our people. Uh, first is security. We have achieved security for the world community, for humanity, for the United States, Afghanistan, the region, and elsewhere. And now we have a strong foundation uh, for cooperation into the future for, again, our shared national security interests. Um, because those sacrifices uh, uh, um, have made the Afghan people, uh, our people and our state, uh, a grateful partner and a committed partner uh, uh, for our joint effort with the United States, NATO, and our regional uh, partners. That's number one. We should not lose sight of this achievement and the foundation we have for cooperation. We may if we are hopefully successful in, in achieving peace, again, there is that foundation for our work together. God forbid, if we do not succeed in peace, still we need that foundation to protect our shared security interests. Second big achievement uh, uh, is um, um, the transformation of Afghanistan. Uh, the, the, its society, its state system, uh, and uh, the appreciation that the Afghan people have for that uh, transformation. Um, uh, first, in terms of governance and state building, we've never been more democratic in our state uh, building and, and governance system. I know we still have quite a lot of uh, flaws in our uh, uh, behavior and, and, and system, but it is more democratic than any time in our over 5,000 years of history. Uh, and the Afghan people deserve it. Uh, uh, and, and this allows for the participation of our women and our minorities and, and every Afghan citizen the way we would like to look at them. So inclusion for Afghan people in uh, politics and governance to determine their own future is the kind of right for which we have struggled for many, many millennia. Uh, and we have it now, and we don't want to lose it. Uh, uh, um, we, we want the Taliban to come back to that uh, system of governance, but we do not want their uh, regime to come and replace that system. Uh, that, that's key for us. Um, uh, uh, second is the huge transformation socially and economically. Uh, uh, never in the history of, Afghan of Afghanistan has our country been able to educate so many our, of our children, boys and girls alike, as we are able to educate them now. I mean, imagine if we had had peace, uh, this could have been, and if we didn't have to fight terrorism, this could have been remarkably different. Uh, but even now, it is a, a better place than we had uh, decades uh, ago. So um, uh, it's exactly for this reason that Afghan people are keen to have peace but to preserve the Islamic Republic and its partnership with the United States and the world community. So I hope that is the, the kind of vision uh, uh, that we will be able to achieve at the end of this process. Well, Mr. Abar, I wish more Americans could know more Afghans, and, but I'm grateful for, for the opportunity to at least introduce them to one Afghan, one for whom I have tremendous respect. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share about the future or anything you'd like to say to our viewers uh, before we end the discussion? Well, that uh, one Afghan is uh, proud to see his friend again uh, and uh, uh, a friend who uh, served with distinction and honor. Uh, and that one Afghan can safely say 
uh, that he represents uh, the rest of Afghans in saying that we are grateful to our American uh, friends, brothers and sisters, and we will always honor the memory of of your brave men and women in uniform, and we will always remain faithful to our common uh, uh, security interests and, and uh, our shared humanity. Thank you, General. Minister Atmar, Tasha Korda, on behalf of the Hoover Institution, thank you so much for helping us learn more about a battleground important to building a future of peace and prosperity for future generations. Please thank our Afghan friends for the risks that they're taking and the sacrifices they're making to secure their future and to fight people who I believe are, are really the enemies of all civilized people. What a pleasure it's been to have this discussion with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, General. Hope to see you soon again. Please, once this uh, pandemic is over, and I hope it will be over for the United States, Afghanistan, and uh, the world community soon. Once that is over, or secure, uh, the, the health regime allows you to travel, we will be honored to receive you here, or anybody from uh, Hoover's uh, Institute, uh, uh, to interact with us and with our academic institutions. Uh, thank you. By the way, I would want to have some more scholarships for Afghan girls and boys uh, to study out there. Okay, we can maybe work on that. And we hope to see you here in California as well. <laughs> thank you so much, General. All the very best. Battlegrounds is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.